सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली द इंडियन बिग स्टेट हैज लेटली बीन स्ट्राइकिंग बैक as it did this week by announcing drastic controls on the import of personal computers laptops tablets and so on this came on top of a relentless state creep back through a quadruple tax collection at source tcs from 5 to 20% on transactions under the liberalized remittance scheme or lrs the freedom the vajpayee government had given indian citizens to invest or spend foreign exchange overseas now mind you this is not for actual revenue collection because any tax collected will be adjusted against every tax payer's final tax calculation so it's not as if as if the government gets more money it just increases the friction in the process of using the lrs facility which might discourage some people from doing so some might think oh it's that much more work so let me let me forget it now to be sure the government also added credit card spending to this restriction as well to this increased application of tcs as well and then as protests grew gave differential limit categories and dates from when this would come into effect indians had lived for three decades since 1991 trying to forget the same bad ideas of the past several more such have occurred the sudden ban on the export of non basmati rice for example causing concern in global markets about india's reliability now it does become challenging to argue over trade in agricultural commodities as questions of food security come in so let's leave it there you can meanwhile pick several other examples the restriction on the import of solar panels mostly from china for example this restriction by the way was not on everybody this was for public procurement imports also public private partnerships then soon enough the government came with an amendment that this did, did not apply to psus now if it is it's a question of public procurement and ppps and you are exempting psus who does it apply to now did that mean the psus could now import freely and a private user could buy buy from them in india at each level you would note the state would have a role we need to look at some details of how this policy was rolled out in 2020 the ministry of finance issued order saying that for public procurement imports from countries sharing land borders with india wouldn't be allowed unless its supplier was registered with the government of india india was buying nothing from pakistan and nepal bhutan did not matter in terms of imports everybody knew therefore that the restriction was over chinese goods well done was the kalbanier sentiment including in the print in fact we did support this editorially in 2022 solar panels were also added to this list this year 2023 psus were exempted from this restriction meanwhile in this period our trade deficit with china has been rising year on year to reach to cross the 100 billion dollars mark back to the latest the laptop tablet issue now the objective we were told on the record first through government statements was to promote domestic manufacturing by the very next day by the very next day the discourse had moved on it had shifted to national security national security had now taken precedence now what's the point of there being a state if it doesn't have the power statutory and even moral moral authority to tell us mere citizens what is good for us what would make our lives and our nation more secure once national security is thrown into the ring the fight or the argument is over now here is some data india's total import of these goods or products now put on the restricted list that is these various categories of computers in the last financial year all of these amounted to 8.8 billion dollars of this about 58% came from china the rest came from korea japan america etc but 58% came from China you can then add two and two and figure out what this change or shift is directed at particularly as security has been invoked now how can any indians 
Even those who have argued for free trade, open markets and reform over the decades argue against the interests of national security. That too in an era where there is widespread action in the western world, all of India's allies, over Huawei and other Chinese tech and communication platforms. In fact, India has banned tech TikTok and many other countries are getting TikTok off at least devices used by their officials. When national security is invoked, Indians usually trust their government and go silent. But it is a more complex challenge than the stuff the Chinese may stealthily plant in your landlord or tenant's laptop. Every now and then, pictures of VIP tours through India's top scientific facilities, especially the laboratories of the Defense Research and Development Organization DRDO, pop up on social media, mostly on Twitter, where sharp-eyed observers note the presence of Chinese CCTV cameras, Chinese-made CCTV cameras, Hikvision being the most prominent brand among these. Even to those like us who know no technology, it is evident that these cameras are networked to a server at least that stores information and goings on in these sensitive facilities. All of that is Chinese. Not everything done in a government scientific establishment may be sensitive or a secret, but nor are all the pictures and videos of family members, weddings, birthdays, convocations, dogs and cats stored in your laptops and mine and personal computers, nor are those national security challenges. National security is a useful ploy when it comes to employing trade as an instrument of strategic policy. That's also valid. You need to see, however, where the substitutes will come from. The Indian experience so far is that when imports are banned or restricted in the expectation of domestic manufacturers filling in, it almost never, in fact, never happens. For decades, we allowed no import of automobiles and, and we were condemned to Ambassador and Fiat slash Padmini for cars and Bajaj slash Lambretta for scooters. Then we opened up, let the world come in and compete. Now we rank among the world's biggest exporters of automobiles. Plus, you know what? Two generations of Indian consumers have had choices that ours, that our generation could not dream of. The latest on computers is a matter of particular concern as nothing, as nothing exemplifies the failures of the pre-1991 license quota Raj more starkly than restrictions on electronic goods imports. In the Indra era license quota Raj, which mostly continued through Rajiv's tenure, nobody from overseas were allow was allowed to come and build any electronic goods in India. Imports were banned and manufacturing, if anything, was to be encouraged in the public sector. That's why so many state governments set up their own PSUs that merely imported kits from mostly from Korea and made television sets and two-in-ones, cassette players plus radio for millennials who may not know what, I, what we are talking about. They made their own. State governments, Keltron, Meltron, Uptron, all these companies came in, Hartron for Haryana. Nobody wanted these and you were always waiting for that favorite NRI uncle to bring you one of these or a civil servant returning with goods on so-called transfer of residence. Baggage belts in arrival areas at our airports were then loaded with boxes of TVs, VCRs, microwave ovens. All this disappeared within two years after 1991. With laptops and tablets now, we want to fully work in reverse. There, because of reform, a lot of the imports were coming in. Now we are stopping imports. We will start making at home and what will then happen is because we need to incentivize make in India, we will then reduce duties on parts. So parts will then come in and some people will then bring in maybe a whole device has four broken into four and they will say all these are parts and then there will be cases. These things we have seen in the past and there is no guarantee that these things will not happen again. Restrictions on foreign exchange were even more draconian than on electronics in the past. First, these were restricted both ways for inward as well as outward remittances. Former banker and now author and serial investor Jaitirth Jerry Rao, who often writes at the print, he also often talks about the fact that in the name of socialism, the Congress restricted us Indians to carry no more than eight dollars. And he, say, he says that is something even the British did not do. Even the British did not restrict us to $8. So the Congress governments restricted us to $8 and later 20, a 150% increase, Shabash, well done, as the maximum we could live with 
for an overseas trip. For every category, there was a fixed limit for which you needed to go to RBI for a quota and a certificate. As a reporter, for example, the RBI allowed me $250 per day in a Western country for every need put together, hotel, food, transport, communication, telephones, everything. For the neighboring countries, it was just $150 or $160 a day. Our credit cards were valid only in India and Nepal. You couldn't, as a result, rent a car anywhere in the real world because nobody would rent you a car without a credit card. So on many of my travels abroad as a reporter, I had to find some friendly Indian diplomat or maybe a foreign journalist or some, some, someone like that to use their credit card to stand surety for a car I was renting and I would of course pay for the car in my traveler's checks. All the exchange and professional equipment you took out, including little tape recorders, tiny tape recorders, reporter's tape recorders and laptops were listed in longhand, in a pen on the last pages of, of your passport. So the amount and the equipment you took out was listed and then the amount and the equipment you returned with were again duly entered. In fact, you want to understand what it looks like, you will see some of these pages on your screen. And I've got my old passports. You see these last pages of my passport, old passports, how soiled they look. People of my generation amongst you will recognize this. Anytime you went out, any money you took from RBI was listed here along with your RBI certificate number. This is EC number, this, this, slash, this, slash, this, slash, this. Money you returned was also similarly listed. And, and again, every bit of equipment you took out, including your laptop or what you used to pass off for laptops those days, the very early ones, those were listed even after the mobile phones came in, at least for a couple of years, you had to list your mobile phone also going out and coming back in. You will see these pictures, these facsimiles on your screen. As we are talk talking, these are pages from my old passports. These would give the post-reform generation an idea of where we have come from. All of that went out of the window with the 1991 reforms. Indian credit cards acquiring global currency was an epochal reform and contributed greatly to enhancing India's global reputation and prestige. Also, our self-respect as traveling Indians. Former top civil servant and one of the key movers of post-1991 reform, N.K. Singh, who now works very closely with the BJP government, headed our last finance commission. He talks about this in some detail in his book, Politics of Change. The decision by the Bajpayee government to allow Indians to spend, invest or remit a certain amount of money in dollars, now $2.5 lakh dollars per year. This decision was taken in February 2004 under what was named the Liberalized Remittance Scheme or LRS. This was a path-breaking step. This was also the last major step by the Bajpayee government before it became caretaker and the elections drew closer, 2004 elections drew closer. It was among the most reformist decisions of this government as well. In fact, there was a conversation I had with Chandrasekhar, the former Prime Minister, which was duly recorded in a National Interest column then, where Chandrasekhar said, look, I am so pleasantly surprised. Just the other day, India was so short of foreign exchange that I had to send India's gold by the plane load to Switzerland to make sure there is no default on foreign exchange by India. And now we have so much foreign exchange that we are encouraging people to take it out. Now, also see other graphics that will run on your screen. When Vajpayee allowed remittance of foreign exchange by Indian citizens, under the liberalized remittance scheme, India's foreign exchange reserves are about $113 billion, $112.9 billion, after two years of great growth. Today, those reserves have grown to nearly $612 billion, right? They've grown, grown by almost 500 billion dollars. So it's not as if just because your LRS remittances have gone up to 20, 25, 20, even 27 billion dollars in a year, it is no, it is no strain on your foreign exchange reserves. It's because of the larger reform of which LRS remittances are a part that your economy has grown, that the confidence in your country has grown, that a lot of the foreign investment has come in and that's why that's one of the reasons among the reasons that your foreign exchange reserves have grown so while more indians may be remitting money overseas for personal needs or personal investments or whatever in the process there is no strain on india's forex reserves india's forex reserves have gone up from 113 billion dollars to 600 plus billion dollars to understand this better please see the graphic on your screen 
that will show you the movement of India's forex reserves over these years since Mr. Vajpayee and his government took this reformist step. Once again, for clarity, I am not saying that India's foreign exchange reserves have grown because and only because it took this step. What I am saying is that this step showed the confidence that India, India expressed to the world at that point of time. And the world appreciated that confidence because, because if a country is not insecure about letting its citizen invest some money overseas or spend some money overseas, and the world also thinks that this country is sure about its own economy, its own growth, its own foreign exchange situation. So they bring in more money. Confidence brings in more money. Foreign exchange or import controls slash substitution was among the many bad ideas of pre-reform India. In a sense, import substitution means an aversion to trade. Because if you're not importing, if you're only doing import substitution, then you're reducing your trade, which is ideologically politically and philosophically so old economy. Every nation that's boomed, including China and definitely India, owes it to trade. At a time, at a time when India is doing much reform, like lifting restrictions on FDI in so many areas, including the most sensitive areas, from defense, from defense production to consumer retail, some of these bad ideas are returning. Do you know what Victor Hugo said originally? With apologies to him, however, let us dare to say today, nobody can stop a bad idea whose time has come. It just so happens that bad ideas sometimes also come in a heap.